So I'm 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 pleased to have a friend and colleague, Professor Owner Askan from Bill Kent University in Turkey joining us today. Uh, Owner and I were uh, in the same lab during our PhD time with some overlap uh, at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. Um, and we had um, some fun. We were not working on projects together, um, but uh, we did we did do a lot of technical uh, technical discussions. And um, and I um I remember joining the lab, and he was a um, a role model uh, of PhD students when I when I joined the lab. Um, afterwards, he went to Harvard and started working on miniature walking robots, um, which he's continued since becoming a professor. Um, back in Turkey, and I'm really excited to see, Honor, what uh, hmm. what you've been working on recently and, and updates. So thanks for joining us. Uh, cool, cool. Thank you very much for the the introduction, Eric. Uh, what he what Eric mentioned, forget to mention, was also we were roommates for uh, two years, so we also shared a, a, an apartment as well. Uh, so it's very nice to to see him again and uh, you know give a talk at at uh, University of Toronto. Uh, so today uh, I'm going to talk to you guys uh, about sort of my, my lab story, like what happened after I joined Beacant in terms of uh, the, the stuff that we do on miniature robots. Um, and we're going to try to cover a range of compliance uh, from rigid to, to soft to softer to softer in a way. Um, so here are a couple of the robots that we're going to see today. Um, so this guy is, is small bot. Uh, we're going to talk about that. It's a soft modular legged robot. Um, we're going to talk about uh, Squad, our soft, entirely soft quadruped uh, made out of polymers like PDMS. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, Minicore, uh, the mini collision resilient quadcopter. Uh, that's a foldable flying robot. Obviously, in this one, it's dropping, as you can see, but it will also fly. Uh, but first, we're going to talk about MINIAC, the miniature individually actuated uh, quadruped. Uh, this is sort of where the, the story is going to start because this was the first robot that I built when I joined Beacons uh, in my lab. Uh, and then we sort of branched into the other ones. And uh, before specifically going into the robots, let's talk a little bit about the inspiration. Uh, so where we take our inspiration when we're building these robots. Uh, and I really like this quote that I sort of ripped off <laughs> online. Uh, and it says, insects at first, can engineers, can we do it better? Uh, I think this sort of explains the bio inspiration uh, quite nicely. We're not necessarily trying to mimic uh, insects or small animals that already exist in, in nature. We're not trying to make robots that look like them. Uh, but we're trying to engineer structures that exploit some of the features that insects or small sized animals have and use these uh, in our robots. So some examples that we try to get our inspiration from is the cockroach. Um, centipede is going to be our inspiration for the small bot. Obviously, centipede is significantly smaller than the things that we do, but also small animals like mouse. Uh, so in this the squat example, the, the squishy one, uh, we sort of started um, thinking like, can we make a robot like mouse so that it can kind of squeeze through openings, uh, you know, wherever, like whichever the opening, like, you know, as you know, the, the mouse, if it fits its head, it will kind of be able to go through a hole. Uh, squad, we kind of envisioned the same sort of behavior. Um, so why uh, miniature robots? Um, many reasons. Like There are many reasons you can count. They're lightweight. Uh, they can be agile. Uh, they're very easily easy to customize, uh, easy to make modular. Uh, they're low cost, which is very, very important when you're a new faculty, especially in a place like Turkey, uh, where you don't get uh, massive funding. Uh, so, you know, big, like you, you can never get like a million dollar project. Uh, but you can get smaller amounts more often. So in that case, like low cost becomes an important thing. Uh, they are rapidly producible and there are many potential applications. Few of them are listed here, but I want to mention one that is very close to my heart, especially in the last few months. Uh, you might be familiar with the earthquake that uh, struck Turkey um, 
I believe it has been three months now, three months ago, uh, the, the Southeast region. Uh, here are some pictures uh, from uh, the, the collapsed buildings. And as you can see, there are many openings and many gaps uh, in these collapsed structures. And uh, what the people, uh, the, the rescue workers, they're trying to locate survivors, right, in these structures so that, you know, they spend their energy on the most crucial parts. Because in some, they're not really anybody to rescue, unfortunately. And in, under some, there are still many people alive. So I'm going to show you guys the video that sort of shows this process of like how they're searching for survivors now. Uh, can you guys hear, by the way, the sound as well? No, no sound. Oh, is there sound of the video? No sound. Oh, no sound of the video. But there's the subtitles. So the, the sound is in Turkish anyways. But the uh, what they're saying is, you know, we're going to do like a listening activity. Please don't speak. Don't move. They shut down all the machinery, all the equipment, the power tools. And then everybody stays very, very quiet now. And there's somebody inside of that small gap sort of leaning in and just shouting, is there anybody hearing my voice? Right? From my point of view, this is not how this is supposed to be done, right? Like you, I mean, at this day and age, when we can make these robots, uh, these tiny, small robots, and you can see like there are a lot of, there's a lot of gap where these robots can fit. And these are low cost robots. We can put like IR cameras on these robots to look for survivors. Uh, we should be able to go there with, a, you know, three, four, 10, 15 cases of these robots, just release them. Uh, onto the rubble and uh, let them find the survivors for us so that we can kind of go in and, and rescue those people. Um, yeah, so, you know, this should be a very ancient way of, of looking for survivors, I think. Um, so uh, this, to me, like the, the miniature robots that we're, we're working on can be very, very beneficial in a, in a uh, scenario like this. All right, so that was the motivation part. Uh, so now uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the miniature robots from literature very briefly. Um, so the one that you see at the, the top left, this one, uh, hopefully you can see my cursor. Uh, so that one uh, is one of the earliest sort of uh, miniature robots. Oh, by the way, when we say miniature, it's not down to micro size, right? It's mostly meso scale, so centimeter size. These are like palm-sized robots or, you know, around palm size, let's say. Uh, so this one was one of the earlier works uh, done by Aaron Hoover, uh, presented in IROS in 2008. So there are a couple examples from literature. This one that you see on the top right is very close to my heart because that was the robot that I worked on when I was at Harvard. And that's where I sort of gained my miniature robot knowledge. That one was called Hammer, Harvard Ambulatory Microbot. And it was one of the first insect scale robots that were out there. So that robot was four centimeters long. Uh, and you see some other examples uh, in, in, in this uh, slide as well. Um, so uh, the one thing I need to, to sort of point out is you cannot make these robots with the conventional fabrication methods. The conventional fabrication methods are where you take a machinery, you know, any machining equipment like lathe or a, you know, CNC machine, and then you sort of make these things out of metal. But scaling laws um, prohibits us from, uh, you know, making these robots from bulk metal and then actuating them with DC motors. Because DC motors are very, very inefficient when you scale them down. Uh, the magnetic forces scale with L to the 4, whereas the surface forces scale down with L to the 2. So uh, the magnetic forces scale down much faster. The friction starts dominating. And motors, if you ever go and buy a tiny motor, they are very, very inefficient. 
So uh, they're usually not powerful enough to actuate a, an articulated leg made out of metal parts. Uh, because of that, you need to come up with alternative ways of making these robots. And one of them is this origami-inspired robotic methods. Uh, in here, you start everything on a sheet. Uh, you cut this with a laser, and then you fold everything into the into 3D structures. Uh, the sort of the one that you see in the middle, the robot, uh, it has a very fancy name. Uh, robot folds itself up and walks away. Uh, made by Sam Felton. Um, so uh, this one was a, a self-folding robot where the joints were heated up in an, a sequential order so that I would sort of assume this, this 3D shape uh, and then kind of with the timer, it would time itself and then when it's all the way up, it will kind of walk away. Uh, so you need to come up with these different methods. And a lot of the stuff that we do are actually origami inspired. They are foldable methods. So we make our uh, robots on single sheets and then we fold them into the, the 3D structures that we're going to see. All right. So that was sort of my intro. Uh, now uh, I'm going to start with the, the first robot that we developed in lab. Uh, this one was called Miniac. It was a four-legged robot, and it was uh, it was driven. It was actuated by two uh, by four DC motors. So each leg had a DC motor of its own. We developed this so that we can modify the gait, the walking pattern of the robot, and then we can do a locomotion analysis on miniature scale to see you know if different gates are going to work differently because we know that they do in macro scale, in like the big scale. Um, so this, the robot that we developed here, uh, the longest dimension is 11 centimeters. It's only a 23 gram robot. The mechanical parts of it, which is the red stuff that you see here, uh, is only weighs about 3.5 grams. So instead of that, that metal bulky thing, you have this. Uh, this is cellulose acetate. So they're acetate sheets that you go and buy from bookstore. And then we sort of um, cut them in laser and fold it. Uh, so the biggest weight is, is the motor seal. It's like there's 7.5 grams. Right? And this robot can run up to 30 minutes with a single cell tiny battery, but it's not very fast. And you'll see that it is very, very bad at walking. Uh, and if you can recognize, it's actually the, the robot that is in the logo. Right? So this is the first one that we developed, and it was the one that we then used at, at our logo, lab's logo. Uh, so this is what the design looks like. Uh, the blue lines that you see are fully cut under the laser, whereas the, the red dashed marks are scoring marks, uh, and that is where we fold the structure. So this part that is sort of in the middle uh, is the middle of the robot, whereas this is one of the legs, this is the other leg, that is another leg, and that is another leg. Right, so you end up with like four legs. Everything is monolithic. You insert your, your motors, you place your uh, electronics on, on top of it, and then uh, you run it. Right? So here's a video showing how bad it works originally. Uh, so um, this one, um, I think we developed in 2016, 2017, around that time. Um, we had to sort of make these sensors ourselves in the lab we made the, the board ourselves uh, it has like a, a tiny arduino on board uh, and it doesn't really work very well which is you know what we're going to come to next uh there are you know specific reasons for it right this robot is envisioned to work like a rigid robot right? everything is supposed to be rigid. it's modeled as a rigid robot but it's very light, so it kind of slips a lot, right? The foot, there's a lot of foot slip, and it sort of has this weird rolling, uh, a very weird bouncy motion, uh, not very stable looking, very slowly rotating in place, right? Uh, so not very nice in operation, but we learned a lot about the fabrication method, right? Now, the first thing we realized uh, when we were trying to fix this, right, fix the issue, was that the trajectory of the feet 
was the the main issue uh, that's causing like this bouncy bouncy motion of the robot. So we came up with a newer a new design an updated design. Uh, we call this Miniac Two, and this guy uh, had a knee a, a pre bent knee a fixed knee joint. Uh, so with this, we thought it would work a lot better because we were kind of making the trajectory uh, a lot flatter in this case. So it was supposed to be much less bouncier, but it still doesn't fix the issue that we, uh, the, most of the issues that we face. It turns out the main issue here is the compliance. Uh, this robot that we developed as a rigid robot and we model as a rigid robot is not rigid at all because of the, the materials that we use, because everything is made out of these films and the joints are sort of these locations, right? They're just one tiny strip of a film. Uh, we assume them to be pin joints. They're not pin joints. Uh, so those joints are, they're bending beams. They are actually uh, bending beams that are experiencing large deflections, not even small deflections. So even though this method has a lot of advantages, like you have very little number of uh, parts that you need to make, the assembly process is easy. Uh, it doesn't consume a lot of time. Uh, you don't necessarily need uh, any lubrication because there's really no friction to, to speak of because there's no pin joints here, right? But the disadvantages are the joints undergo fatigue failure. There are deflection limits. You cannot have a joint that would rotate 360 degrees, right? Other than, you know, like these pins that you sort of insert here. But the, the regular joints that you make, they're limited to uh, 120, 130 degrees. And there are a lot of geometric nonlinearities that you're in introducing when you actuate them, you know, and when you bend them to 20, 200, sorry, 120, 130 degrees. Right? Uh, so we needed to find accurate trajectories for this. We need to identify load carrying capability of these robots. And we needed to obtain stresses so that we can define the, the fatigue sort of cycle limits of these joints. Right? We've done that which I'm not gonna go into details because they were horrible. Uh, we spent a lot of effort uh, on developing the large deflection theory on this. There are a lot of elliptic integrals that come in and out and it's, it's really very, very hard to deal with. Uh, and I didn't do it, my student did it. Uh, fortunately, I didn't have to do it, but it was, it was not very easy. But it turns out there is a difference, right? So uh, the trajectory wise, we assumed we were getting or we were gonna get the green but instead you would get the black trajectory. And that sort of changes the kinematics of the robot because this is only the leg kinematics for a fixed leg. Then, so, you know, you can kind of optimize on this and get like a flat version of this trajectory, a relatively flat version of this trajectory. But then you need to model the dynamics of the robot, right? That would kind of take this, this trajectory inside and then find like the, the, the robot operation so that Kind of you can work on the gates and uh, sort of run maybe another gate optimization so that would, the robot would walk properly. Now, uh, in most cases, like making this for rigid robot is, is not very hard, right? Uh, it's very well known, but then the model is mostly going to be usually a Lagrangian. It's somewhat easier to deal with, um, but then you need to know the joint torques, which we don't really know. Um, because we are also, our actuators also are not torque controlled. Uh, they are very cheap, very tiny, like these Pololu actuators, Pololu DC motors. So we were controlling the speed of these motors, rotational speed. Uh, as a result, we had to go through the no Newton Euler method of, of the model. And in this case, you need to model the forces coming from the ground, which we did as nonlinear uh, spring damper systems. And you will end up with these uh, 12 horrible looking equations, uh, but you can sort of solve them or well, MATLAB can solve them. You don't really solve them, but you know, you can ask MATLAB to solve them and sort of get the dynamics of your robot, uh, which was the thesis of, of one of my students. Uh, we presented this in Montreal in 2019. Uh, so we developed this whole model. Uh, and the good thing about the, the Newton Euler method now is that uh, because normally like these things uh, there's the uh, you know 
spring loaded inverted pendulum method for like walking robots that is sort of make things a lot easier. But then you always assume the foot is stuck at a position on the, the ground and there's like a spring. In this one, if you do Newton, Newton Euler, you can get the, the foot slip behavior as well. Like you can pretty much simulate the whole dynamics of the robot in a nice way. So my student developed this whole GUI. Um, you can interact with it, get to whatever angle you want. You can turn this into a skeletal diagram. Um, and then you can change all the, the initial conditions, set the robot to, to any position, any orientation you want. Um, and then he's gonna run the, the simulation soon, or he can select between MINIAC 1 and MINIAC 2. Um, and run whichever robot he wants to run. Um, and now once it starts, you can visualize the forces. Um, so that was very important for us so that we can kind of see what's happening um, and the, the way the robot sort of walks is very similar to, to what happens actually in reality. Uh, but you cannot do this with a regular like OD45 or so, a solver like that. You need to use one of the stiff solvers or the 15S. So anything with the S inside. Uh, and then we verified our model. Um, so this is Trotgate, the simulation and experiment, the behaviors, the rocking behaviors, like the all of them are the same. The speed sort of matches nicely. We can see in the simulation. The, the robot actually sort of uh, the, you know experiences put slip just like how it is in, in real life. Uh, we can get the, the front view to see the roll angle, which you know they're all the same. So we verified our, our model, right? But we don't necessarily in, in robotics, especially in, in engineering, we don't model things for modeling's sake. Uh, so we did this model so that we can speed up our gait analysis. Right? Because we wanted to see how different gates would work, um, you know, at different sort of uh, in a different in a smaller scale, right? So this is the uh, one of our current works. We um, developed different gates. So we came up with this optimal gate, but the optimal gate here, um, the optimal is a very loose term, right? Because it depends on your cost function. So the cost function here was to maximize the, the translational velocity, but we'll see soon that we use another cost function. We wanted to make the robot prance uh, because we thought maybe it would be better if it prances, like it, it might go over obstacles a little bit. And that was another optimization. Right? In that case, the front lift was the, the cost or the the front lift was the award function in a way, right? You're trying to uh, sort of maximize the front lift. Uh, it'll come soon where the robot sort of walks here, trots, prances, and trots. And we found how to do this in our simulations, and then we applied it in our robots and sort of got the same behavior. Right? All right, so um, the compliance so far for MINIAC uh, has been a, a trouble. It's it it was a nuisance for us. It was an issue that we had to deal with. Uh, but it's not a, all. Our hypothesis was that it is not always going to be a problem. Uh, so we started investigating uh, some other other robots where compliance might help. And the first one that we're going to look is is Smallbot, the soft modular legged robot. Um, it's modular in a sense. It's not reconfigurable. Well yet in the slides. Uh, we are working on that, but the, the ones that you're going to see are um, are modular but not reconfigurable. So if you want to make a six-legged robot, you make three of these modules, the leg modules, and then you make two backbone modules, and you connect them to each other, and you get a six-legged robot, right? Um, so we wanted to, we developed this so that we can study the effect of compliance, especially the backbone compliance on robot locomotion. And we also wanted to study the effect of number of legs on robot locomotion. Uh, so this is what the, the robot, uh, one module of the robot looks like. It's sort of MINIAC cut in half, in a way, the previous robot cut in half. Uh, it has a foldable body and a leg mechanism, uh, again, made out of acetate sheets. Uh, this is what the design looks like. This is what we cut from laser. 
And then we have these uh, you know, T folds and these locks inside uh, to keep the body uh, modules rigid. The width of every module is about 4.5 centimeters, which is the, the longest dimension of this robot. Uh, the length is about uh, 1.7 centimeters and side is about 1.5 centimeters. Uh, and it, each module weighs about 19 grams because it, each module carries its own electronics on, the batteries on, uh, and the, the motors and everything on, on board. Uh, the backbones made out of PDMS using regular molding techniques. Um, so uh, we made different versions of this. We made uh, rigid versions, which is the one that you see here. And then we had the, the torsionally compliant and the, the uh, I-beam type compliant uh, versions. Uh, so here is the initial version. Um, this is the top one is a rigid one. The bottom one is a compliant one. Uh, that was two modules, so this is three modules. Um, so this is how it works. Um, especially, you can kind of see the, the compliant ones are, are torsionally quite compliant, so they do this a lot. Um, so this is how they kind of can turn in place. Uh, there's going to be a rough terrain locomotion. Again, the rough is in terms of its own scale. So, you know, that's the rough terrain that it's working on. Right? Um, so this is, yeah, so it's a, a six-legged version, a three-module one. So uh, this was the initial uh, work on Smallbot. We then had to come up with, again, the dynamic model of this, uh, which was based on the MINIAC model. But now you have the separate modules, which means that each module is going to add six more degrees of freedom to the system. So uh, at the end, you end up solving six times n ordinary differential equations when you sort of are dealing with this. And, and again, the input parameters are, again, contact forces, but this time also the backbone mom uh, moments. Um, so we did the modeling and we verified the model with our experiments again, and we started to see something interesting. The compliance, the backbone compliance starts to uh, affect the speed of the robot. Uh, now, if going faster is what you're trying to, to get, right? Uh, then compliance actually helps you. The black one here is the rigid backbone robot, whereas the, the compliant torsional backbone, as you can see, sort of uh, can increase the speed uh, quite a lot, especially in certain frequencies. Um, we've also seen that, which is not very interesting, I guess, uh, but uh, the pitch and roll angles reduce quite a lot when you have a compliant backbone compared to a rigid one. Um, so if you switch the small bot from a rigid backbone to a compliant backbone, you can get higher velocity. You can reduce the roll angle from 12 degrees to six degrees peak to peak. Um, also improve the pitch angle from 10 degrees to seven degrees, again, peak to peak. Uh, but also it becomes quite resistant to impacts. Uh, we, the robots, unfortunately, during experiments fall a lot from the, the tabletop uh, down to the, the floor, uh, and it really doesn't break uh, fairly easily. Um, so then uh, we started to, to realize right, the stiffness should have an optimum value for different frequencies because we see a separation between the rigid one and the compliance ones, especially for certain frequencies. Right? Now, uh, what we realized is from like 5 to 11 hertz, you get a specific optimum stiffness uh, that would sort of maximize the speed of the robot. Uh, we also try to find the optimum gates uh, for small bots that has rigid or compliant backbones. And I think this is like one of the most, uh, that, that was one of the most interesting things that we, we tried to do. Uh, because it turns out the optimum gates for a six-legged robot, eight-legged robot, ten-legged robot, they kind of look very similar. But the regular like when we think about a six-legged robot our initial thought is okay so we have a six-legged robot let's make it work with a, a alternative tripod gate so three legs touch down and then the other three touch touches down and then the first three touches down 
the other three touches down, and you form this sort of triangle, right? and then you keep like changing the triangle. Right? Uh, it turns out the optimum gate is quite different than this. Again, the optimum is like the maximizing the speed. Um, the optimum gate is very bouncy. So it's as if like, if you have a six legged robot, it's like three kangaroos holding back to back and they're kind of like jumping together essentially in, in sequence. That's sort of what it's, at least that's what it resembles to me. So uh, the front and the mid module in this case for the, the six legged one is periodically lifting and the two sides are kind of run together, the two side legs with the, the optimum gate. We will start to see like the eight-legged one and the ten ten-legged one, and they are very similar. And also, the optimum gait changes with the the backbone rigidity as well. Like for example, at this version, right, the the third module is at some point is the only one that is actually touching down, where the other ones are in in air. So this is the ten-legged version, where you can see like the the two, the three, and the five are actually not touching at this instance at all. And we will be able to to see this from the gate diagram as well, uh, which is I think what's coming up next. Uh, in the gate diagram, there are certain sort of times where only two modules are touching down right, and sort of propelling the robot forward. We verified these results with experiments as well, with the three-legged, sorry, three-module, four-module um, robots. And the optimum gates are, are significantly faster compared to the other ones. Um, so, uh, another modification that we did afterwards was to, um, cut the legs off, which is sort of an interesting update, I guess, but we cut the legs off from the robots and then we replaced them with these C-shaped legs that you might have seen in robots like Rex, uh, the R-H-E-X robots, uh, that was developed, I think, at UPAN in Daniel Kodicek's lab. Um, so we replaced it with the sea legs. And what happens is, it's quite interestingly, when you have a sea-legged robot, even a single module can actually properly walk in a way. Uh, so we ended up you know, checking what would happen if we have like a, a one-legged, a one module, like a two-legged one, a four-legged one, a, a six-legged and an eight-legged one. The dimensions don't really change much. Uh, so it's pretty much the same design, pretty much the same backbones. Uh, but now, as, again, as I said, uh, single module versions can actually work as well. Now, a couple things we realized was that the compliant backbones possess the highest velocity among these trials, and soft legs conform to surface more. Here, we, we also tried like rigid legs, 3D printed legs. In order to make the friction coefficient the same, the rigid legs were coated with a thin film of PDMS as well. So it's not only the traction that is, or the frictional difference that is causing this. Uh, and then we added a, a tiny tail back to it uh, to see if they would be go, they would be able to go over sort of uh, slopes. Uh, and a single module one cannot, as you can see, it's supposed to go upwards, but it's kind of falling down, unfortunately. Uh, but a sort of you know uh, one module with a tail, it can sort of go upwards as well. So now we're working on a reconfigurable version of this uh, with some magnets uh, in the backbones that would connect them together. And we have, again, the rigid versions and compliance versions, and we're sort of analyzing them. Um, OK, so the next question is, once we've done these, right? the next question is, can we go even softer? Uh, but that comes with another question, uh, which is, should we even go softer? because we don't really know if it's going to help or not. Right? And for this, we developed this robot that we called Squad, uh, the soft untethered quadruped. Uh, the Squad is the one on the left, 
The right is a is an imposter, a rigid version of the same robot. It's a rigid twin, uh, made out of three D printed materials. Um, the left one is PDMS, entirely soft. We also have a crossbreed of these, so actually two of them. So there are four robots that in this study. There is the the entirely soft one. There is the soft body rigid leg one. There is the rigid body soft leg one, and there is the rigid body rigid leg one, which is what you see here. Uh, this robot is significant, significantly heavier, as you can see, uh, and it's mainly because of the body, right? The body, previously we were doing everything uh, foldable, but now this is uh, PDMS, so you're made out of molding. As a result, they are quite heavier. Uh, we tried to make flexible P uh, PCBs, sorry, flexible PCBs, which, as you can see, didn't really work out very well. Uh, so we ended up ordering them uh, from a manufacturer in China. Uh, and the robot that you're going to see, it doesn't have these ugly uh, flexible PCBs on it. Uh, it has this sort of nicer PCB. Um, and initially, uh, sort of we compared them all uh, on flat terrain. Right? And on flat terrain, being soft doesn't really help you. Uh, you have a certain amount of energy that you're feeding into the system, right? Uh, there's really no need. Uh, you know, if you... So some of the energy goes to the undulations of the body, right, and, and everything. So in general, the, the velocity, the, the translational velocity, the forward velocity slows down uh, on, on flat terrain. But then if you try to go over obstacles, then it becomes an entirely different story, right? So this is the entirely rigid version. The robot can go uh, 80, 0 0.88 times body height but won't be able to do 0 0.92. Um, the soft leg version will be able to do 1.08 times the body height, but won't do 1.13. We'll see that it's gonna tip back, I think. Soon here, yes, there it goes. Um, the soft body hard leg version can do 1.13 times the body height, and you'll see like the body kind of curls over the, the uh, sort of hill, I guess, obstacle, but it won't be able to do 1.19. But if you make everything soft, it can do 1.44. And you know, you can see how it's kind of like curls over the obstacle. Right? And it was, it's a massive improvement compared to the previous ones, which the largest one they can do was like 1.13, I think. Uh, so it turns out being soft can help, right, on rough terrain, especially in a, in a size scale like this. Uh, you can go over obstacles um, sort of quite nicely. Uh, the next thing we did with the squad was uh, cut its body in three parts, the mid module and the front and the, and the rear motor modules. And we developed these sensors. They are 3D printed sensors, um, fairly easy to manufacture. And they are similar to strain gauges in working principle. We measure their resistances, but a strain gauge, once you stretch it, uh, its resistance, or if you bend it, its resistance is gonna increase. Uh, in ours, if you bend it, the coils touch to each other and its resistance or the, the electron essentially find a shorter path, right? So as a result, um, the resistance actually drops very significantly. A regular strain gauge, you start with the 10 kilo ohm resistance. As you stretch it, it's gonna go up to 10.5, maybe 11 kilo ohms. This one, you start with a 10 kilo ohm sensor, you bend it and it drops down to one kilo ohms, right? So it's a, it's a drastic change in its resistance. Uh, now we uh, sort of, put these sensors inside the robot body. Uh, and we were hoping that, you know, we would be using how the body bends during operation. Uh, we will be able to sense this and maybe make some decisions based on that. So as a result, uh, we sort of developed this very, very basic algorithm. You get the raw data from the rear sensors and you look if the sensors have a saturated response for uh, longer than a second. Uh, if it doesn't have that, 
then it says, all right, so I hit something, you know, but the obstacle seems scalable. So, you know, it still keeps moving uh, because you can still see the obstacle, right? There's a, a jump on the, on the rear sensors. Uh, but if it's continuously saturated for a second or more, then you say, okay, I don't think I'll be able, I will be able to go over this obstacle. And then you sort of kind of gracefully uh, come back from, from that, that obstacle, right? So here's a video showing this. Uh, so this obstacle is not very big. You can see that the rear sensor sort of, you know, kind of see something, but it doesn't saturate for a long time. It doesn't even saturate, I think. Kind of just kind of goes over or goes to a, you know, three, 3.5 volts. And now it comes to a massive obstacle and you will see the robot's shape soon. That is kind of going to have this weird shape that is going to buckle and that is going to cause the sensors to saturate and the robot understands that it hits a big obstacle and kind of comes back now when it's moving back obviously the previously front sensors now became the rear sensors so you need to check the other sensors now uh, but it sort of continues to smooth all right the last robot that i'm gonna talk about today is minicore uh, this is the only non-legged robot that we make in our lab. Uh, it's a miniature collision-resistant quadcopter. Uh, it has a foldable body. So uh, we developed this hoping that this foldable body, the edit compliance, is going to help us in crashes. Right. So we'll have this robot so that uh, it can bounce off the walls and keep flying. Um, so here is the, the drop test. The first one, we don't see anything, obviously. Now, this is a slowed down version. And you can kind of see how the, the arms uh, holding the, the motors sort of act as if they're um, kind of like rotational springs or beams that sort of bend, right? So here are some flight tests. So the robot sort of comes towards the wall, hits, bounces off, kind of springs off the wall, and then keeps flying. So we'll see here a little bit more clearly how like the, the um, sort of bumpers squish and kind of push the robot off the wall and make it fly or keep it flying, right? And now, obviously, this sort of works up to a degree, right? If you kind of come with a massive tilt, it is if the, the rotors hit, right? It, it falls down, obviously. Um, the next one and the last one of this, the, the last version and the last robot that I'm going to show is Scorer, the sensorized collision resilient aerial robot. We said, well, we develop these sort of coil shaped sensors and we have this aerial robot. Why don't we kind of combine them together and maybe uh, we can make a flying robot, a, a miniature flying robot that can fly with a sense of touch. I right? would bump it to a wall realize that there's a wall there without using any sort of uh, video cameras or, or you know, anything like that. Um, now here's the, the video of, of this robot. Um, so we first had to do a sensor location study. So we have a camera looking down on the robot just to sort of see where it is. Um, and then we sort of take a look into like which part of the bumper kind of bends the most. And that's where we place our sensors. And this is the robot coming very slowly to the wall towards contact. And the sensors can sort of understand that there's an impact and the robot retracts. Uh, here's an impact test with 0 0.2 milliseconds. It bumps, again, goes back. Um, so this is 0 0.5. Um, this robot can go up to about three meters per second, uh, almost three, three meters per second, which I'm not going to show you all. But the next one is 0 0.9. Uh, and as you can see, as the impact grows, right, the, the sensor sort of response also grows with that. Uh, and the last one is a case study where the robot hits with 0 0.4 milli, uh, sorry, meters per second and then try to stay in contact with the wall, right? So it bumps and then keeps the contact and you can see sort of like the, it from the, the sensor response as well.
All right, so to sum up, um, I today I talked about the robots that we developed in Mutual Robotics Lab. Uh, we developed light, cheap, small robots uh, from range, from rigid to compliance. Uh, it turns out compliance can help you with locomotion speed uh, for rough terrain locomotion, with impact resilience, as we've seen from the, the quadcopter example. But you need to design for compliant locomotion. So if you haven't designed your robots as if it was going to be compliant, like the Miniac example, then it is going to make things significantly harder for you. Uh, so what's next? Uh, we're trying to develop software robots just to see if they're going to help us. We're, as I also mentioned, we're developing a, a modularized version of this guy, Smallbot. Uh, we're modeling soft robot locomotion, albeit not with much success, I should say. Uh, it's not very going very well. Uh, and we're trying to model the effect of compliance on flight dynamics, which is going relatively better than the, the, the previous one. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. If you guys have any questions, I will be very happy to, to answer them. Thanks, Owner. Great talk. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, listening about your work. I especially liked your excellent videos and your videos with the force. Uh, contact forces are so helpful to understand what's happening because it's going so fast. And um, so congratulations on, on Thank helping you. us visualize Thank you. that very nicely. I also enjoyed seeing some familiar <clears throat> presentation techniques that I guess we both learned from Metten during our P PhD. <laughs> maybe, I, maybe, yes, kind of that makes sense. <laughs> um, I see some questions. I'll just ask one to get started. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a different optimal stiffness for different running speeds, which makes a lot of sense. Um, right. It's cool that you could kind of identify that. Do you think there's potential or is it too complex to have like a variable stiffness that adapts on the fly? Is that something? You uh, yes, that is a very good question. Um, so... Fun. <laughs> um, yes, it does, but I think it is possible. Uh, it's just that uh, we need to let go on some of the stuff, right? Um, so one thing, uh, there are multiple ways of, of having a variable stiffness. Uh, so there's the tendon driven versions of the, like you kind of pull on the tendons to make it stiffer and then you release them to make it softer. So there's that. Uh, there's the, the pneumatic versions, right? So there's uh, those things. There are some maybe phase changing materials might be involved. Uh, the, the trouble is, so uh, by the way, we are working on a version of this, the tandem driven version of this, uh, because we might also use it for, you know, actuating the, the backbones up or down. Uh, we're maybe even like thinking we can kind of make a robot that would kind of curl up like that as well. And it would kind of, you know, sort of, tumble down or whatever. So uh, there are different versions. Uh, and I think uh, once you have a tandem driven mechanism, you can use it for a varying stiffness, variable stiffness mechanism. But then we're now working on reconfigurable version. I think at that point, you kind of let go of the reconfigurability uh, because you need to be able to connect the two modules together at least from my point of view, with a with a fixed thing, so I don't see how uh, kind of you can make make it a, a variable stiffness thing. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think that would be advantages, right? Especially if you know on flat terrain, you don't really need to be soft. You don't need to be compli compliant. It it doesn't help you with anything. Like if you're just just gonna walk on on a on a desk or whatever, right? Then it's it's fine to be be hard. Uh, the compliance really helps you with with some other stuff. I feel like. Do you think walking organisms at this scale are variable stiffness or? Oh, for sure, variable? for sure. Yes, I'm. I'm sure they are. Right. I mean, even we are. Right. Like we can sort yeah. of do this and you know kind of contract our body a little bit and and make ourselves stiffer. Um, you know, it it will help and um. I'm sure like, you know, when you're running, uh, not that you'll see, like, I don't really run much, but uh, a lot of people sort of, you know, when they're running, uh, they'll, you know, flex certain muscles. And it's, it's something that you learn, right? Like is uh, sort of like, you kind of have this, this rhythm as you keep hitting the ground, like with a certain frequency, right? It, it has come to like a, a natural sort of, um, a, uh, how should I say? 
uh, like a, a, a natural, like a, a, a sort of repeating behavior, like a pattern that you do, you at a certain frequency, like you kind of like kind of learn intuitively, I think, how to do this. That's why, like, as a baby, you don't really know how to learn, but as your muscles kind of uh, uh, grow and then you sort of start to to change, like the stiffness in, in your muscles and, and joints, then you actually start to properly learn and then properly walk. Uh, so properly walk and properly uh, run right so i think it's it's it exists in all um sort of animals and and probably some insects as well um but it's very hard for robots that being said you know you can employ some learning algorithms with that as well right like yeah. robot can learn how to go faster yeah uh, so well, there's another question at the chat maybe i should yeah. kind of take that is it possible to develop the legs with uh, TPU material in 3D printing? It is definitely possible. Uh, so we are using a lot of TPUs. Uh, we are developing some of our backbones. Uh, you know, they're 3D printed with, from TPU. Uh, but and that would in be, general, for people who don't know, hmm. TPU would be a flexible resin. Oh yeah, it's a flexible film on ter thermal uh, plastic urethane, I think is what, what it stands for. Uh, and uh, it is a flexible 3D printed material. That being said, it is not very flexible, right? So TPU is a material like, especially if you do like with a high infill rate, um, it is actually not that flexible, uh, but it is possible if you have like good quality 3D printers, uh, I'm assuming. Uh, we, we have some, uh, you know, they, they work nicely enough for our case, uh, but the TPU surface finish can be an issue. I feel like uh, that's what, what we kind of face. So uh, the surface finish of the, the uh, molded PDMS is usually a lot nicer. Hence, we kind of make it with from, from PDMS usually. But yeah, it should be possible. And it should work fairly nicely, actually, if you like. How do we determine the, the geometry of the C-shaped legs? Uh, was it optimized for locomotion compliance or overcoming the obstacle? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, there are a lot of works on this. Uh, for ours, uh, we sort of uh, tried to maximize the contact when they were touching down. So we kind of made them long and, and follow like a circular shape um, in a way. Um, the C-legged, C-shaped legs, as you go further away from the, uh, from a regular circle, it becomes more and more bouncier. Uh, especially, you know, as you as you follow a circle with the the outline, um, when they're in contact, at least they kind of behave like wheels. Uh, so that was the only uh, optimization. Well, it wasn't a proper optimization, anyways. I, that was the only sort of thing that we had in our minds, uh, and we made it, and they worked, and we didn't really play with it afterwards too much, uh, to be very honest with you. Uh, but I I remember like the in the original. Rex paper, R H E X paper. Uh, so that robot, I think, or in one of the papers of, of those robots, there are some some discussions about this, like how you should uh, sort of determine the the C leg geometry. Good question, Priscilla. So, Anur, um, I, I um, I understand a lot of the the work you're trying to advance these miniature robots is in the design and mechanical design and um adding this compliance uh, compliance which is which is really great and um also appeals to me as the mechanical engineer with me but i'm wondering how much um of a bottleneck is are the electronics hardware for these is this something that's good enough for what you're doing now or is that a is that something that also needs advances for what you want to do in the coming uh, years. Right. Uh, yeah, that's 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 a very good point, right? Um, so if you're doing basic science and the, the stuff that we do in the lab, right, just checking on compliance and how it affects locomotion, how it affects impact and, and these kind of stuff, uh, for us, it's enough, right? We don't have any, any sort of complaints about the status of the, the electronics that we can get our hands on. Now, that being said, if you want to take these outside of the lab, right? Then it becomes a, a different issue. So I mentioned, like uh, you know, uh, being able to use these robots in a under a collapsed building. Uh, so for those, you need to integrate uh, cameras on board, 
right? You need to have an IR sensor, IR camera on board, you need to have uh, microphones, uh, you need to have a couple of these things. When those start getting in, then the electronics start more problematic. Uh, the communication becomes very problematic in an environment like that, right? in a cluttered, very cluttered environment. We don't know if we can get a signal outside, to be very honest, of, of a collapsed building, if we put them in. So, um, uh, but yeah, so those, um, well, we first need access to a collapsed building, right? Uh, it, apparently the government has some, but we kind of are not allowed in yet uh, to try our robots in. So uh, we, we need to, to take a, a look into that. Uh, that would clarify things electronics wise, uh, you know, if the current state of the art is, is enough or not. Um, another thing that we don't know if it's going to be enough is for online learning things. Right, so if you need to do some online learning of, of some parameters, then it might also not be enough. The, the electronics, the processing. But, uh, you know, other than that, uh, if you're doing what we are doing, which is, you know, you're in the lab making these robots and writing papers uh, for, for those kind of applications, which is not very useful, right? But for those applications, it is, it, it, it's enough. Fault detection and reconfiguration means the robots have extra motors or modules if there are some faults. Uh, yes, ideally, right? That's why we we want to have these multiple uh, like modular, reconfigurable modular versions that, uh, very good question, by the way, very good point. Uh, we have these uh, sort of, you know, let's say, on, again, under a collapsed building site, right? You have like these four or five of them that can work together but they can also separate and go and investigate separate areas. Uh, they can come together to go over an obstacle. Um, and if one dies, then that one is dead. The other four covers the area, right? So ideally, yes. But even if, uh, you know, they're reconfigurable, you don't necessarily, uh, like, you don't think the the extra motors as, like, extra motors because you, you, you need to carry one of the modules. Uh, we envision these robots not to come out of the collapsed buildings because these are like $200 robots, right? They're not very expensive. You put them in, they send you a signal. They don't come out necessarily. They can stay inside. Uh, so they're quite, you know, relatively quite cheap if you're looking for people. Uh, so it's, it's not a big deal. So it's not even like, a, you know, extra motors. It's in like if one is dead, just leave them. And then, you know, the robot, right? If one module is dead, just leave that dead robot module and then you carry on with the rest of the robots. Um, we like the manufacturing. Maybe we'll just take the last question, question from Chloe and then we'll, we can move to maybe an informal uh, uh, session sure. afterwards if anyone wants to stay. Thanks. Yes, of course. Um, so, uh, uh, thanks so much for your presentation. I really like the manufacturing approach of laser cutting and folding assets. Yes, thank you. Uh, for the compliant robots, have you reached a point at which your robot becomes too compliant to support itself or move under its own uh, weight? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I'm, I'm sure there is a limit to that, right? And um, some of the robots that we do, so the, the, the modular one actually kind of hits the ground when it's walking uh, every once in a while, but it's mostly because of the, the sea legs. Uh, you know, at some point, if you run them together, the, uh, you know, when the sea runs out, essentially, and it uh, kind of hits the, the ground. For the, the squad, the very compliant, this very soft one, um, it didn't become too heavy, but it sort of kind of crawls. It comes very close to the ground, but it can still move. And I don't see a problem as long as it, it does a, a proper locomotion looking thing. I don't think it's a it's a big trouble uh, if it kind of touches down every once in a while the body touches down, so it didn't happen uh, in our previous work though with the hammer the Harvard ambulatory micro robot, uh, it happened in that actually uh, with the six legged version the joints were so compliant the joints of that robot was made out of Kapton, the joints were too compliant and the robot was too heavy at some point it was like a very fat bug. It kind of just fell on its belly and it was doing this, but really not moving on the ground. 
So I think, uh, you know, it becomes, you know, too compliant when it's not able to move anymore. So ours were, were, were always moving. So uh, I think it didn't happen with us. Can happen though. It's quite normal. I'm just thinking of a very overweight cat. I saw that its belly was dragging so much that it like got stuck on, <laughs> on the carpet. Yeah. <laughs> um, great. So we can maybe do a little informal session afterwards, but uh, we'll kind of wrap up the the formal time and, and end the recording. Uh, thanks, Owner, for joining us for a virtual chat today. Uh, well, thank, really thank you. Thank you very much for, for having me. Oh, and I, I, I envision this, this future where you show up, you get out of a taxi, and you're carrying 10 briefcases, and yes. you open it and say, guys, everything's going to be OK. Yeah. There's 100 robots come scuttling. I know. Out. Yeah, I know. It's like, scram. Just go find people, right? Like, do whatever.